Next is Charles Menzies. Charles is an executive member of the UBC Faculty Association. And with the executive director sitting here, I want to say a key member of the UBC Faculty Association. He's also an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology here at UBC. And we all know Charles here on campus and you know Charles elsewhere in the province also as a catalyst for social justice. He demonstrated tremendous leadership in supporting the teachers throughout the strike, throughout the civil disobedience as both a parent, as a, parent a professor, and an activist. His research focuses on culture, ethics, ecology, and labor. And I'd like you to welcome, join me in welcoming Charles Menzies. Thanks, Charles. Well, thank you. I, I want to just say a, a quick couple word of thanks to the academic units at UBC that's made this possible. Uh, the Department of Curriculum Studies and Education, my home department of Anthropology and Sociology, the Department of Political Science, uh, the Center for Women's Studies and, gender re uh, and the Study of Gender Relations, and the First, Na Nation, the First Nations House of Learning, and the Canadian Studies Program, all units at UBC. Also, the journals Workplace and New Proposals, which are online uh, publications. Two weeks that shook our world. I think that's what you could call the teacher strike, and I will use the word strike. Uh, but is our world really any different the day after the strike ended than it was on October 6th? To be quite honest, I'm not really sure. The Ready Report offered some important economic and some important political gains, but like the Surrey Teachers Association's nine reasons to vote no, I think I would agree that the Ready Report left very much to be desired. But my comments here today are about the significance of the strike as seen through the eyes of a parent and a university-based researcher who is actively gay engaged in organizing a variety of strike support activities. Rather than rehearsing what went wrong, I want to talk a bit about what went right and how as people concerned about public education as students as teachers, as support staff, as parents, as grandparents, as just simply community members who care, we can, how we can build upon this experience in such a way as to ensure that the arbitrary use of legislative power is stopped once and for all. And I think in a legislative democracy, we really have to seriously consider the way that prerogative is used. We can no longer use it as the crown carrying out our will to speak in the royal idiom. <laughs> it has been my experience as a parent, I think, that has been the single most important factor pushing me to become involved in supporting public education and the people, and also supporting the people who try to make that system work. I have served on parent advisory councils in a variety of capacities, on school planning councils, first at Queen Elizabeth Elementary, where one of my sons went, and currently I am on school planning council at University Hill Secondary. And I served a term as an executive member on the District Parent Advisory Council. I want to say hi to Debbie, who's the current chair of DPAC, who's joined us here today. Like many other parents, I have also, I've done all the types of volunteer activities that turn up from driving on field trips, fundraising, hosting lunchtime programs, speaking in classrooms and issues related to my university research, uh, picking up things, hosting luncheons, saying hello, greeting, filling out forms, licking envelopes, filling out news, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's an awful lot that goes on that parents do in the background that actually makes the system work and contributes to the way the system works. In my capacity as a university-based researcher and educator, my work is focused on issues of social inequality and equality and the way that public education can be modified to make a difference that counts. I do work in a community of Kakatla, which is a First Nations community in the north coast of this province, and education rates there are horrible. And the legacy of colonialism is one that I don't think any principled or fair-minded researcher can ignore. And much of the work that we do, we try to link it to educational issues in addition to looking at the purely academic work. And I think that experience, experience as a parent, the experience as a researcher, make people like myself really concerned about what we see. And so 
it may be labeled political, it may be labeled partisan. The fact of the matter is when you see an inequality and you sit by and do nothing, I think you're complicit. And I think is as apparent that this is what's pulled me, probably first and foremost, into the realm of politics. And I have said this before, to be quite honest. If it wasn't for the thanks to my sons, who have, in a sense, driven me in a variety of ways at, to be a parent advocate for my, or an advocate for my children in the school system, I, to be quite honest, would rather be talking in different political venues. I'd rather be talking about social forum that just happened in Argentina. I'd rather be talking about what's going on in Venezuela. I'd rather be talking about the situation. Well. But the fact of the matter is it's something that really strikes home that's very important, which drives that passion. In fact, it's changed the way in which I actually try to organize my teaching in this environment. But, you know, one of the things I marvel at is the way in which we have a society that claims to value education and then acts in ways that actually undermine the very education that it claims to support. So in 1998, the then NPA-dominated school board decided to readjust the staffing problem mid-year by laying off 400 teachers to get rid of 100 positions because they miscalculated the number of students that were in the system. Uh, unfortunately for the RCM, or Vancouver police officer who came to the PAC meeting at the school I was at that particular event, uh, we weren't, most of the parents weren't really interested in the drug talk. We wanted to talk about the 13 or 14 teachers who were being laid off uh, to replace to rejigger the system, and we didn't think there was a good way to do staffing mid-year. We organized a demonstration, and about 300 plus people turned up on the, on the doorsteps of the, the newly opened or new, being opened uh, 3P project, uh, private-public partnership, that the Vancouver School Board offices actually is. The next year, my wife and I found ourselves in a meeting with a learning assistance teacher and a school principal topic what could be done to assist the particular learning needs of one of my sons and I have to confess to finding myself completely speechless when the principal said yeah, we really can't do anything go purchase services by the way you know after all you are a West Side parent and we did in fact go and purchase services for the ch our child's education and at that point in my in our life in our household life and things we had one income and we didn't really have a lot to go around and that was an important issue but it's one that not every parent has the ability and it's also one I don't think any parent should be asked to do and I think that was happening under a nominally supportive provincial government I think with the election of the new provincial government in 2001 things did in fact go from poor to very bad from my particular point of view and along with other Vancouver PAC parents, I joined the nonpartisan Save Our Schools campaign in 2002 that mobilized nearly uh, 14,000 people, as Catherine's already said, to sign a petition to support public education. And here we found ourselves in a situation that a legislated contract with teachers, combined with changes to things such as the medical services plan, had actually transferred significant cuts in public education budget to the school boards, which in Vancouver resulted in a $25 million shortfall or cut. As parents, we drew upon our volunteer networks, our parking lot and schoolyard acquaintances, and built a movement that based itself on the premise that every child, in fact, deserved a real chance to learn. We are careful to avoid partisan politics, uh, though a certain reporter in the Vancouver Sun attempted to draw John Robertson and myself, John Robertson being a former NPA school, uh, school board trustee, into an uh, acrimonious debate, and neither of us bit. Um, and so we are careful to avoid uh, the politicalness. To, to argue otherwise, uh, pardon me, while being careful to avoid partisan politics, we have to recognize, of course, that this is, in fact, political, no matter what people say. And as I mentioned earlier, to argue otherwise is to pretend that one does not have a perspective or a position. What we are doing in Vancouver was mirrored across the province and, I would suggest, played a significant role in shaping the very broad-based and effective support for teachers that we saw during the teacher strike. The October strike is notable from a parent perspective for a number of reasons. First, it was supported. I think that's a really important thing. And not every teacher action or public sector action in this way has been a supported action, and this one was. And even though our official parent voice, the BC Confederation of Parent Advisory Councils, proclaimed, proclaimed loudly on October 19th that a crisis had hit the education system on October 7th, 
parents have seemed to, dis to have disagreed. It seems that a significant number of objections were sent to the BC CPAC executive, and on the support blog that I ran during the strike, I have a number of examples from PACs, PAC chairs who critiqued the claims that irreparable harm was being committed on our children due to a strike. And in fact, the BC CPAC documents themselves from the late 1990s indicate that in particular with reference to special education, that there was a crisis in public education. And so I'll leave it to that. Uh, second, I think the strike demonstrated the central importance of the relationship between teachers and parents in the care of our children. It is, some have commented, an uneasy custody between parent and teacher in the, in the, in the raising of our children, but I think it's an important one that needs to be recognized. And many parents that I spoke to during the strike emphasized that the relationship between teachers and parents is a critical one that needed to be supported and maintained. I think it is unfortunate that our provincial parent voices, our, our provincial parent voice has, it seemed, placed so much energy into, and I do use the words deliberately, vilifying teachers by, through emphasis on things such as misconduct panels, on removing the, collect, the right to bargain uh, of a of group of workers within the, uh, the, the system, and the focusing on a whole range of things that, f that identify what I th really think are the minority uh, participants, and they, they represent the same sorts of people you would find in any public group. I think that what we need to co come back to, and you can find the resolutions, for example, in BC CPAC, you can see the good work that has been done in some of the partnership and education materials in the past, and I think in general, I think the Vancouver DPAC, for example, has a uh, PAC 101, a handbook, and a number of other resources. There is a way of emphasizing and building upon the positive aspects of the relationships between teachers and parents. And I actually think that that was one of the positive things, one of the things that made, it, made the strike is significant, is the relationship and the recognition of this relationship between parents and teachers. And third, I think the other thing that's significant, and this is, again, speaking from my perspective, is that the strike actually had the possibility of going longer. You know, from Westside parents holding morning breakfasts at Queen and the steps of Queen Mary, to parents in the east part of Vancouver at Queen Vic holding a barbecue, to parents in the north coast of this province standing in hurricane force winds beside teachers, on and on and on, example to example to example, parents and members of the wider community were standing there side by side with teachers. And I think we can't overlook that fact. That's a really important event. I mean, the last time I heard about parents and teachers standing together in, in actual job action type events was actually in France uh, several years ago. And that's a quite a different political culture than we have here. And I think this represents one of the single most important developments of the October strike. The teachers' cause was one that was, in fact, political, I would argue. It was political in the sense that it was a strike in support of democratic principles that involved not only the right to collective bargaining, but and I think more importantly, was about the central role that access to effective public education plays in a democratic society. And here, parents from right to left, from wealth to poverty, from rural to urban, found common cause with teachers. This was both a classic labor employer struggle and a democratic rights struggle. And the democratic rights that I'm talking about were the democratic rights of our children to receive a, f a fair, accurate, effective, and available education system. I think if I have a criticism, it's more likely to be laid at the feet of those in the House of Labor who pulled the plug on the teacher's strike. The, de the demobilization of labor before the vote on the Ready Report sent a clear signal to teachers and the rest of us that it was time to stop, time to go back to the classroom. The focus of our struggle for real democracy, I think, must expand to include organizations of labor and community. Here, as well as the... Uh, here as well, I think the teacher's principled and radical approach to democratic practice could be held up for an example for all of us. At each step of the way, as Jenny has mentioned earlier in her presentation, union locals of the BCTF met, discussed, and voted. And this was no strike. This was no strike that could be uh, ended, and excuse the rather ancient reference, no strike that could be ended by a Jack Monroe-style meeting on a premier's veranda, going back to 1983. <clears throat> I mean, I think the teachers have, with apology, taught us a lesson. It is that working people can stand together collectively and hold accountable 
those who rule with the interests of a minority in mind. In the struggle for real democracy, we do need to take risks. The teacher stood up and held the government at bay. As a parent, I see my role to stand beside my children's teachers. As a university professor, I think I have a particular privilege and responsibility as well to make sure that these debates and ideas are given a place to be heard. It's too, it's too easy in these institutions to demand balance, to demand to, to pull ourselves out of the fray, to claim in some way that the performance indicators we demand, the evaluation mechanisms, the claims for excellence are some way not political, when in fact they are very much political acts. And in this context, to be silent is to agree with the arbitrary use of legislative power. Thank you. <laughs>